Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you all for joining us after what's already been a very packed day full of uh, breakout sessions. I'm like a kid in a sweet shop on, on these kind of things, so I hope you've all enjoyed them. Um, now, hopefully, you've spent the last few hours learning a bit more about how to, to do sustainability, how to do ESG. Um, and as we've already said, the next 40 minutes is going to be focused on... Um, talking about the movement that's built mainly in the US over the past 18 months um, to try and stop <laughs> us from doing <laughs> ESG and sustainable finance um, and, and looking at what that means for, for everybody in this room, really. Um, to help us do that, we have three fantastic panellists that I'm very pleased to have with me. I'm actually going to ask them to introduce themselves, if that's okay, because I want them just to position themselves in the ecosystem a bit, so we know the perspective that they're coming from. Um, I think that's important uh, in the context of this conversation. So Nathan, maybe I can start with you. So Nathan Fabian, I'm responsible for our sustainable systems work at the PRI. So we think about how responsible investment sits in the financial system and how the financial system sits in the economy in relation to sustainability issues. So I have an interest in policymakers and what they say and do. Thank you, Gabriel. I'm Gabriel Wilson Otto. I work for Fidelity International. It's a global asset manager. Um, not to be confused with Fidelity Investments, which is the US part of the business. So my focus is speaking from an international perspective um, as an asset manager. Fab, thank you. And Sharon? Sharon Hendricks. I sit on the CalSTRS board, which is the California State Teachers Retirement System board. And I'm an educator based out of Los Angeles, California, and we serve over a million uh, teachers and their beneficiaries um, in Sacramento. So great to be here. Thank you. Thank you all for joining. So the sustainable finance industry is, is pretty bad at buzzwords, pretty bad at using very small phrases to represent very big, complicated things. If I, hear, if I hear the phrase double materiality or nature positive one more time in the next week, because I think I'm going to scream, but ESG backlash maybe falls into the same category of being hugely complicated. And we talk about it without really revisiting it. So the first thing I want to do, Nathan, if I can, is ask you to kind of throw an anchor down here and tell us what we're actually talking about <laughs> when, we, when we talk about this stuff. I'll try and do that. Thanks, Sophie. Uh, so, if we're being objective, uh, an ESG backlash or anti-ESG probably means doubt about the motivations and practice of considering environmental, social and governance issues. So, very simple, doubt uh, in the motivations or practice. But, of course, it's more than that. It's more than being sceptical. It also involves active opposition and interventions to dissuade us, to dissuade those who find considering environmental, social and governance issues useful in their professional jobs. And it's probably worth considering different sources of doubt where it's coming from. So there are some very constructive and reasonable voices in this discussion. Uh, there are some that maybe are less so, but let's explore it, explore it. So there are those that believe that ESG practice and methodologies are not clear enough. And we may all take that view to some extent, but some companies especially have been outspoken on the use of ESG ratings and are not satisfied with the role they play in the, the proxy process, for example. Then there are those who believe the ESG platform is too wide and too inconsistent and it distracts from pressing issues like reducing emissions on climate change. And I think we can put the editorial team at The Economist into that bucket. So let's call that one friendly fire, shall we? And then there are these other groups, and they're perhaps, uh, they have different motivations, and they're a little bit harder to respond to, I'd say. So are those who actually see risk or uh, uh, some detriment to their economic interests from transition? I think we need to recognise that there are groups out there. And a vested economic interest can cause criticism of processes in the investment community to consider environmental, social and governance risks. The term, uh, you should not discriminate against, fo against fossil fuels, is often used. That's how this group feels about it. Uh, and then, of course, there is the group, the political group, that sees ESG as a value-based question. They see it through a values-based lens, and really we have a wing or a group of the uh, conservative uh, 
Party in, and the Republicans in the US, and they see an opportunity to campaign and fight against this as part of a broader platform of uh, uh, a values-based campaigning. But really what makes these last two groups distinctive from the first two, who are probably asking reasonable questions, is that there uh, is a distinctive use of public criticism and the pursuit of investors. And I think this is new and this is a thing we haven't seen before. And it appears intentional to subvert or stop action. And this is... Uh, I think, putting a lot of pressure on you. And if you're being directly affected by this now, I just want to say at the PRI we understand and we're trying to work out the ways we can help. Can I go a little further? Yes, you can. I won't go on forever. But one of the questions was, who's on the receiving end of this? And I started to write a list. It's a very long list <laughs> of all the targets. So... I think we need to recognise first that the people really on the receiving end of this are the citizens and beneficiaries of states where governments are directly intervent intervening in the investment processes and the way public funds are managed by professional people acting in good faith, uh, deliberately constraining these processes adds cost, whether it's for underwriting uh, of bonds by investment banks or whether it's for the management of investment pools, fund pools by, by investors. We should bear that in mind, and there's plenty of data available on this, so I won't go into all the detail. Of course, there are investment managers probably in this room who've lost mandates and have had their professionalism criticised in public. We've had investment banks had to withdraw from certain markets because they've effectively been blacklisted. We've had proxy advisory firms being criticised for the way that they use ratings and the way that they uh, uh, opine or recommend on ESG proposals. Importantly for this community, the collaborative alliances, CA100+, GFANS, Net Zero Banking, Insurance, uh, Service Providers was the most recent one, the list goes on. We should recognise the not-for-profit organisations like Ceres, who have been directly, uh, 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 what's the right word, uh, subpoenaed, actually, to provide documents and evidence. Uh, and this is now getting into quite a large group of targets for this campaign. And I, I think we need to recognise that some of the questions and the questionnaires that are coming and the push are not, do not appear to be constructive. They appear to be designed to bog down uh, you in endless rounds of legal review and jumping through hoops. And it is possible that this is intentional. Uh, and so we really have a campaign on our hands. And if we're trying to be specific, and this is my last point about who's driving this, we know that there are 21 state attorneys general in the United States, and there is a small group of congressional Republicans who are supporting this campaign. Our understanding is that the more moderate uh, part of the Republican Party does not see a lot of political upside in this, but nonetheless, there's a clear political uh, group who's driving this issue. So maybe that's good for an opening. Well, I have a follow-up question, if I may, cool. which is about... So there are Democrat states that have, have intervened on the other side and, and requested things like divestment aligned with their I ideological pursuits or their political commitments, um, which in some cases are being kind of questioned about whether beneficiaries will be cost money f for that. Are these the same... The same things? So we should look at the, the evidence. So uh, I think it's 165 attempted legislative interventions yeah. by the 21 states. Not many of them have been successful. On the uh, fossil fuel divestment side, we have one <laughs> in Maine, and we have an attempt in California, which has not proceeded. And largely the investors with both of those uh, state situations have not been pleased and recommended against it. So I don't think we're talking about the same thing. Okay, in terms of scale. Um, the next question, I guess, is, uh, and it builds on what Nathan said, but the, the kind of legitimacy of some of these uh, criticisms. Um, investors, uh, maybe we can come to you. Uh, Gabriel, maybe you first. Uh, uh, is there some legitimacy in, in some of these challenges? So 
It's a very wide range of challenges that yeah. were just represented, <laughs> so I need to be careful about making sweeping statements about it. But from, from my perspective, when I look at the backlash against ESG, and especially from a, in a global context, I see it boiling down to a few elements. So there, are, there can be a political side to it. There can also be a fundamental side around confusion around what is an ESG product promising, and that can lead to misconceptions around whether it's achieved its goal or whether it's actually delivering. So specifically, I find a lot of the statements around the trillions of dollars that are now managed with sustainability objectives and outcomes. However, we still have trillion dollar funding gaps for most sustainability objectives we're targeting globally. So for me, that highlights that a lot of the assets that might be being written up or positioned as being dark green or sustainable in one context are actually more about risk mitigation in the way that that fund is constructed. And we definitely see this across Asia and also across Australia with a very big focus on clarity of disclosure and consistency of disclosure and transparency. Um, so from my perspective, that's one side of a pushback against ESG in terms of what are we promising as an industry? How are we delivering it in a high quality way? And then how are we being held to account by various stakeholders? And where is the regulation coming in? The other side is a little bit more nuanced. And I think that that's a difference between when an investment is made from a financial standpoint or when it's made from a values standpoint. And for me, this is where there's often a lot of additional confusion and debate as to what is that perimeter of financially material or financially involved decisions and when do you move into the realm of values. And part of the challenge here is that there are differences in different parts of the world around the role of a corporation in society and how much you should be tilting towards that more values-driven component as part of a fundamental long-term value creation or social license to operate. So for me, that grey area is as well where we've seen some allegations of companies maybe going too far in one region, maybe not going far enough in another, depending on the different perspective that comes. So from my side, I think that there's it's it's an incredibly complex topic, um, but I think that there's a few different levers that are leading towards it. Right, and a bit of a tightening up in the way that we frame these things and, and a, a thoughtful about it. Sharon, anything that you want to add? I would just add quickly, and I, I will just you know comment. I'm the asset owner on this panel, a trustee sitting on, um, on an institutional investor fund, CalSTRS. Um, and so what I would just add is I think what I see in this backlash and some other criticism in the investment industry is it's sort of... It's dividing those who are really doing the work and, and those who aren't. I feel like it's, it's in, in some ways, I'm looking at it as a positive in some ways, which is hard to believe, but I think it actually, um, it's sort of self-sorting out. And so we at Callisters look at this and, and kind of see uh, who are the, the ones that are really doing this work. And it, it kind of reveals those who are, well, some would say, greenwashing. So I do think there's some positives, even though there's many challenges. So. Interesting. It's good that it's, it's not all bad news anymore. Nathan, you love to talk about regulation and policy. Do you want to tell us <laughs> what the legislative sort of response to all of this has been thus far? Yeah, so of those 165 anti-ESG proposals... Uh, in 37 states, around 15% have passed in some form, and they take two main types. One is limiting the use of ESG data, and the other type is some kind of boycotting prevention attempt. <laughs> uh, and so these, uh, leg these legislative instruments literally are designed to stop you thinking about something and stop you doing something. It's really quite challenging, and I think the uh, investors in those states are having a hard job of working out how to actually work with those, uh, those arrangements, especially if they have a fiduciary view on a risk that's maybe related to one of these questions. They're, they're wondering how they actually can honour the, the, the legislation that's been put in place. So I think this, uh, there's still some way to deal through how this is going to pan out. I already told you about the limited divestment side. Maybe the other issue is that... Uh, and this goes to Gabriel's point, clearly we're at a point in responsible investment uh, and responding to sustainability challenges where we need to be much clearer. And there are several steps that 
this community is taking and that standard setters are taking to help us do that, we should have a baseline of accounting standards, for example, for the first time. This is going to be a massive contribution on uh, ESG ratings and our assessment of companies and our engagement. Uh, even though Europe has more talent than most for regulating uh, and enthusiasm, they are breaking ground on some pretty important ideas. Uh, we are going to need tools to assess our contribution and impact on environmental and social goals. And so I at least am an advocate for taxonomy and the attempts to classify investment approaches, I think that's quite important for the integrity of the market in future. And this can help us work through some of the issues. It's very legitimate to say I consider ESG risk and serve my clients. That's a reasonable, responsible thing to do and we need to, mm -hmm. we need to honour that. And we also need to respond when clients and investors say, well, actually, I'm in this for the long term and I, my beneficiaries and clients need a safe climate outcome and so what role can I play in that transition? That's part of a fiduciary role as well. So if we can be clear on these things, the data we're using, the roles investors are playing, then I think we can respond to both ends of this debate, which is you're not being clear enough and maybe you are over-promising sometimes and sometimes we don't intend to do that, uh, but also uh, the, the other end of the debate, which uh, the sort of socialist plot end of the debate, where this is only values driven and every single investment has basically got some political agenda, which we know is not true. Right. Okay. So there's there's lots of interventions, and I mean this is this is US focused, but it is having ripples all over the world, um, and, and the regulation legislation you're talking about is US focused. I, I got a phone call from, from an asset manager a few weeks ago, who I'm obviously not going to name, but who said we can no longer talk publicly about the energy industry at all, full stop, just not allowed to. And I get kind of have conversations like that often with hmm. investors all over the world. Um, so it feels from an outsider, as a journalist, that this is having a profound impact on some of the people that you know I've been writing about for the last ten years. Um, is it is it having a, an impact on on the way investment decisions are made? Is it is it having just an impact on the comms and, and the way that we talk about it? Sharon, maybe we can start I, with you. I can start um, with with Calisters, and and maybe we can move more to the global side with with Gabriel, but. I would say no, not at CalSTRS. I don't think it changes um, the way investment decisions are made. We certainly read the news and the newspaper, and um, we know what's going on. But I think you know our ultimate focus, I have a couple of trusty colleagues in the audience today, and we are very laser focused on California teachers and making sure they have a secure retirement. And so you know, every time we go into that boardroom and make decisions, it's really with that in mind. And uh, many of you know that um, you know, we're living longer. California teachers live a really long time. We have over 400 California teachers over 100 years old. Um, it's the water or something, but uh, clean living or something. Um, but that, you know, for those of you who are actuaries in the audience, you know what that means, which means if they retire at 63, we're paying pensions for, you know, 37 more years. So um, that's our core belief. That's our focus. We have a long-term vision for how we invest. So we're not reacting. We're not day or week, um, we're looking at, um, you know, three-year, five-year, 10-year, 30-year horizons. So um, we are doing things to hold corporation account accountable for creating long-term value, and we're managing material risks. And so for us, those ESG risks are just part of good investing, that we need to be thinking about those things. And so um, for us, it's slow and steady, continuing to maintain. We're open to learning and open to new strategies. But for us, it's really about mitigating the risk for California teachers and, and really finding value in, I think, a lot of the, the arena for sustainable investing. So we're kind of excited about what's in the future. But in terms of the strategy, we're staying the course. Okay. Stead, steadfast. And what about sort of the way it's talked about? Maybe maybe that is changing, Gabriel? Um, I, I think that it, we need to break it into two parts. I think that where we're seeing no change, and this is proven by market data as well as our own clients, is the demand for a high-quality, sustainable product. And so if we look at market data for Europe, there's a clear distinction now between higher quality products and products with looser standards around their ESG integration or performance. And so we're seeing divergent performance. So since 2020, January 2022, there's been 82 billion of inflow into higher quality funds that disclose under Article 8. 
and 72 billion of outflows of funds that are lower standards within an Article 8 range. So this is effectively saying it's a range that is positioned as promoting environmental and social characteristics, and there is differentiation around the flow of assets to the quality of ESG integration. So for me, that's a really interesting point because it still highlights that when sustainability is done in a robust, authentic, and transparent way, the demand is remaining, with, especially within Europe. Um, also, the other interesting side that we've seen, and this is from in responses to demand from our clients as well as regulators globally, there is a much stronger focus on the internal discussion between us and our clients around how we're evidencing the claims that we're making about our funds. So we have our own consistent frameworks, data sets, tools, increasingly we're being demanded to report that or demonstrate that on a regular basis to our clients in order to be able to highlight that we are able to deliver on the promises of our products. Trust and verify. Trust and verify. Like the, yeah. the other side that we're also seeing is that there has been some concern from some of our clients around the volume of sustainability information that they may have historically been putting into the market. And so, given there is some pressure on the authenticity, the consistency, or the quality of that data, there has been a bit of a pullback that we've been able to observe with the volume of public disclosure on sustainability topics. So, I think that within the market as a whole, there has been a little bit more of a conservative approach, more of an involvement of compliance and legal in reviewing sustainability documentation before it goes out. Um, and again, to like the earlier comments, I think this is actually a very positive development because it's pointing towards increased scrutiny and leading towards higher quality, more consistent and transparent disclosures. So from what I'm seeing in across markets, there hasn't really been a change in direction of travel, but there's been a re-engaged focus on the quality of how we get there. You made it sound like a really good thing, like the <laughs> ESG backlash is the, is the way to our happy ending. Maybe it is. Nathan, do you have anything to add on that? Because I'm, I'm bewildered to all these headlines I've been reading. We're a very resilient community, <laughs> aren't we? Uh, I think it's a real headache for everyone, but what um, Gabriel and Sharon are describing is one uh, chain, one part of a broader change. And I think it goes back to the fact that everybody wants us to be clearer. We want to be clearer, mm -hmm. and the goals are getting quite clear. So now we need a financial system that's clear on environmental and social issues and, it's, and, and what we're doing in our financial products and our investment approaches. So the trend is being driven by the regulation at one end, like in Europe, and the critique and the other, but the thing I'm not sure our uh, Republican US uh, uh, colleagues have realised yet is that they're really helping to firm up the fiduciary flaw under responsible investing with the scrutiny, and that is a positive because we are going to be quite clear about what we're doing and why, and the fundamentals are actually there. Like, we're all quite clear there's, an, there's risks, related to environmental issues because of changing economies and this is going to affect companies' cash flows and how they allocate their balance sheets. So we get to pecuniary interest quite quickly doing our fundamental investment role. And so because of that, this debate is going to firm up the fiduciary floor under ESG. Three positive perspectives on this. I'm, I'm slightly outraged. On green hushing, because we do hear about green hushing, it, it is, I mean, it, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, I suspect you're all about to tell me it's a really good thing, but um, <laughs> <laughs> green, green hushing and the pressure to sort of not be as, as vocal about some of this stuff. Is that, a, I mean, is that just what, what you're talking about and people are just being more conservative? This is a really positive um, way of making sure people are not sort of um, coming out with things that they're not actually capable of delivering on? Or, or does it have downside to it? Because, I mean, there, there are plenty of people that think it does. I wonder if you have any, any other views on, on potential I just downside. have a, a yeah, quick no. comment about I just I, I'm an asset owner, but I feel for asset managers because I think that... Um, you know, they're trying to be responsive to clients, but there are laws and, and some of these states, you know, they have to be compliant. So I, I do feel for the asset managers out there who are trying to navigate some of these um, delicate situations, I would, I would say. Um, so with that, I, I do think that's why you're seeing in the papers some of these asset managers kind of 
pulling out and pulling back from being vocal because they're, you know, they're trying to, you know, if you're trying to generate revenue, you want to be thoughtful about who and where you do business. So I have some compassion for the asset managers out there. <laughs> for, for me, I think that if, if again, there are, my favorite answer, it depends. Um, so I think that there are situations where a asset manager or asset owner has looked at the risk reward of providing an incredibly expansive set of descriptions around everything that they do and then made a decision to trim certain components or to wait for their data, their systems to be better, to have a higher level of confidence behind reporting a number or other sorts of issues. So for me, I think that there's definitely within the industry, there can be circumstances where it's led to less complete or less available information in the market. Um, there, if we look at, but again, this differs by region quite significantly. If we look at Europe, I would argue that the mandatory disclosures under SFDR, we, there is now a wealth of information that was previously unavailable on a lot of a, a huge range of different funds. If we look at some other markets, there has been a reevaluation of the risk reward of having very, very comprehensive and um, broad disclosures. And part of this leads to a debate around if a metric isn't included within an investment process, should it be disclosed? And is it a, are you potentially misleading a client by having that information in a standard report? And what sort of disclaimer do you need around it? And this is where the legal and compliance industry is growing even faster than ESG AUM in terms of being able to address and monitor those sorts of challenges. Nathan, anything that you want to add on this? L lots of potential things to say. Uh, we have a waiting list for CA 100 plus. We you have, have a waiting list. We have a waiting list. We wow. have in, in investors to participate. We have growth in the net zero asset manager alliance. We have growth in the net zero asset owner alliance. Uh, investors still seem to think that collaborating and advancing their practice in these areas is essential. So there's no major concern on that front. Uh, and I think that even the banks who have had a lot of direct scrutiny are still working quite hard behind the scenes on their approaches. So, you know, the, the substance here is actually okay for the moment. Of course, we're going to be dealing with a political cycle here that will run right up to the uh, US presidential election. And who, who knows what we get after that? We're not quite sure what we're going to have next week, actually, <laughs> with the Republicans at this stage. I'm told the vote will be next Wednesday and there'll be an interim uh, speaker until Wednesday. So they're going to try and clean up uh, the situation today quite quickly. But what we really get in terms of, if you haven't heard, the Speaker of the House was dismissed by his own party, first time in US political history as uh, the Republican You're welcome, party. everyone. You're welcome. Yeah, exactly. It's US's gift to the Lots rest of, of the world. Welcome to our nightmare. Yeah. But I did want to piggyback, though, Nathan, what you were mentioning, because I know, I know California kind of is seen as the, you know, we're the liberal left, although come to Los Angeles, things are changing there, I would say. There's a lot of polarization politically. Um, but there were a couple of recent um, Senate bills that were just passed on climate disclosure, which is really, I think, exciting and um, requiring private and public companies who do business in California with over $500 million in annual revenue to publish a TCF aligned report. Um, SB uh, 253 requires public and private companies who do business in California with over $1 billion in annual revenue to disclose scopes one, two, and three emissions, which I know we're trying to figure out three emissions, but at least I, I feel like there's some legislation happening in California that, that hopefully could move the needle across the country. And um, I know the SEC, there's some pending, you know, regulation happening there, hopefully on climate disclosure that we hope will be finalized. So I do think that there's, um, you know, some exciting pieces of legislation that are happening that hopefully will be mimicked across the, the country to kind of, um, even though, you know, it's, it's more transparency to me, more transparency, more information is going to make um, all of us better investors. Um, so that's exciting. So we've been very US heavy. We've got a very uh, international audience, which is great. Um, so I want to talk a bit about the implications of this and the potential of this elsewhere in the world, because um, I think it, it does really matter. Um, Gabriel, can I ask you? 
sure thing. Um, I, I think that I, I made you know, some comments related to this earlier, so I'll just build on some of those differences around what we're seeing in international markets around backlash and where it's being driven and the sorts of responses that we're seeing in different markets. Um, I think that there's there's been a definite response by regulators around the rapid growth in sustainability assets and the lack of clear terms to help define or hold investors to account about claims that are being made. And for me, that's one of the biggest areas of challenge, as well as the rate of change in adopting new requirements or in undertaking a transition towards a more sustainable future across a wide spectrum of issues. So pace of change, quality of disclosure, and volume of disclosure is effectively where we're seeing the biggest pushbacks in different markets. It does have different flavors in different areas. Um, so I'm based in Hong Kong. Um, if we look at the demand for sustainable assets and even government-led initiatives in mainland China, they're off the charts in terms of the focus on driving green assets, on driving socially aligned assets, on coming up with local taxonomies in removing some of these challenges on classification and fund labeling. So I think it's actually, if I look to Asia, it's actually very exciting with the level of regulation and focus. And I think part of the reason is that it's still at a very early stage. The percentage of assets managed in this way are much smaller than they are in other parts of the world. Um, and also it's seen as being often clearly aligned with a national objective. And so this can get much more um, focus on trying to attract international capital to hit energy transition targets, to hit net zero targets, to um, uh, target poverty alleviation and other challenges that are in these countries. So for, from my perspective, there's that alignment, which is a little bit different. The maturity level is a little bit different, so it gets a different focus. But if we step back, some of the key elements around is this values driven versus is this fundamental driven, how transparent are funds, are we able to understand what they're contributing to, uh, the more common elements across different markets, and then there's some are just dialed up more or dialed down relative to where you are across, across Asia or Europe would be my summary. Okay, so the, there is something. Nathan, do you have anything to yeah, add I on this? I did want to say something on this. I think it's important, I mean, I, I, we shouldn't dismiss uh, the political view in the United States is we need to sort of understand why it's there. And I think it's indicative of what we might start to see in other countries as transition becomes more difficult. Uh, we know that as economies try to restructure, it is not going to be smooth. And so there are chances, uh, as we heard in yesterday's plenary, this idea of people being stranded is actually quite important. And so uh, politicians get their support their, their money and their voting support from somewhere, and so there is anxiety around transition. So while we're not seeing this contagion of criticising investors in other countries, we are going to see some of the same political pressures, and I think this is relevant to all of us, and this is why we need to engage on good policy setting and why uh, clear policy frameworks are actually so important, uh, because there is a risk of a, always a risk. We've seen it in France, we've seen it in other countries. Mm. Uh, the UK is even having a little dalliance <laughs> with the idea of regulatory rollback this week. So it's just there is a substantial issue there for us to be mindful of. And worth, worth people keeping in mind also probably that just transition, we talk about it as this abstract thing, but it's getting easier to, uh, to touch and smell at the moment in terms of some of the political conversations certainly going on in the UK at the moment. Um, big question, but... What, what's going to come out the other end of this discussion? Um, you know, what, what are we going to be left with? It sounds like we're going to be left with maybe some really good things, some clarity around the way we communicate and so on. But uh, Nathan, can I come back to you? What, mm. are you? what are you anticipating? I think we've picked up some of the points. So much more transparency and clarity on what our responsible investment activities are intended to achieve and what they are achieving. Uh, I think this is broadly a good thing, and so the trend is fine on that. Uh, the big shifts are going to come through the standards globally that will allow for a more, a more rational conversation. Uh, I think that we as a community need to keep putting our message, including in political circles, that we believe we're performing our fiduciary role and serving our clients. And that is why we consider these factors. And so it's... I think it's incumbent upon us to do that because it's not, we haven't won that argument. 
with part of the political spectrum. And so if we don't land that argument in the next couple of years, then we're going to have more and more, more, and more challenges. So it, it's uncertain, it depends, uh, on that question where we land. And so this idea of engaging with uh, our political parties is actually quite important on this, and I think it's something we all need to consider. So there's some positive prospects, but we do have some more work to do. Gabriel, any, any views on where we're likely to land? Um, I completely agree. <laughs> I'd just summarise it as saying what I'm optimistic about and what I'm less optimistic about. Um, so the optimistic side is definitely around data, standards, labels, transparency, ISSB, um, looking at the mm -hmm. consultation paper that was released on SFDR. Um, I'm personally a massive fan of um, what's happening in the UK with SDR and the framework that's being put in place. Um, so we're seeing more elements of that type of thinking popping up in other jurisdictions. So movement towards harmonisation, slow, but moving there in terms of um, categorisation at a high level and also on the data side. Uh, what I'm less optimistic about is the more fundamental differences around that distinction between what's financially material versus what's value-based. I think that there are fundamental dif fundamentally different views in different parts of the world, um, which could lead to ongoing confusion, ongoing challenges around what the role of a corporation is, how it needs to act. And then I completely agree with the conclusion that as investors, we need to be very clear about why we're acting, how we've set the standards that we set for our individual funds, and how they're appropriate for clients with different preferences. Right, okay. There's, there's a, a lot of work to be done. Sharon, if, if you're sort of speaking from an asset owner perspective and from a kind of PRI perspective, what, what, what should investors be doing to respond to all this? You're staying steadfast. What's your kind of guidance for other people? Well, I do think, I mean, Nathan touched on the policy piece, and I know for us at Calster, it's just embedding sustainable investing language into our policies. And for all of you out there, just having policies to me, or have I, I feel like I've become nerdy about policy, but how important it is to have language that really provides clarity about what direction your fund or your institutional in, in, investor, um, your asset owner, whoever you are, that you're really clear on your intention around sustainable investing. I also do think it, it matters to get connected, at least for us in the US, with the SEC and other relationships so that we can move policy. I'm really excited about working with the PRI staff in the US around shaping that policy, and I think signatories in the U.S. can do that. Um, I also think collaboration, just being here this week, I've learned so much um, from my Japanese colleagues and other people that have been here that have lots of really interesting ideas about how to move the needle on sustainable investing in our funds. So I do think, um, to me, collaborating, exchanging, talking more with each other. Um, also, we're doing at Calsters, we're having our um, directors of our asset classes talking with each other. We call it the collaborative model. So new ideas and ways to kind of embed sustainability along uh, across our entire asset, all of our asset classes. Um, and then I guess last, I'm biased as an institutional investor, but having the long view. And I've done this for over 10 years now um, to serve as a trustee on the board. And I've seen a lot of, um, it's like a roller coaster between the economy and politics. And there's a, a lot going on in the world that impacts our boardroom. And I just think you have to keep that North Star of who are you serving. And for me, it's California teachers. For you, it's going to be a different um, group of beneficiaries or customers. And if you keep your eye on that North Star and have the integrity to focus there, um, I think you will not go astray. I, I just see a lot of people reacting and... Um, it, it, and it's tempting, and I've done it too, but I just think if we can kind of keep our North Star, um, that long-term vision, and, and remember who we're serving, um, who we're investing on behalf of, that, that, that's the key. So I'll leave it at that. Fab. Nathan, did you have any final thoughts on how, how you think we should be responding to this? Yes, I, I think Sharon's uh, wisdom is very clear. Uh, we're, we're serving others, and as long as we continue to communicate on that basis, we have a chance here. And we're not really in the game of fighting politicians in public. That's for politicians. <laughs> but if we keep commuting, communicating what we're doing, it's a really good start. The other thing I'd say is if you've got concerns on legal questions uh, around antitrust trust or collaboration or anti-competitive, just get some advice because the lawyers are all pretty much saying the same thing, and that is that 
uh, when investors get together, they share information, they jointly write to companies, they go and see companies jointly about their performance, that that's not an antitrust issue. So if you're unsure or your colleagues are unsure, just get some advice so you can move on from that and then we can get back to the task at hand. Fab. So, I mean, I think in conclusion, this is a big, this is a big deal because sustainable finance is starting to matter. There was a point at which a few years ago, I think we would have been desperate for US politicians to even care what people were doing in sustainable finance. I think on the big picture, it, it, it's a big deal because it matters. Hopefully, a bit of clarity and a bit of more authentic dialogue is going to come out of this around what we mean Regardless of the anti-collaboration movement, you're saying collaborate more, keep going, keep your eye on the prize, do this um, over the long term and make sure that you've got the appropriate sort of time frame for, for your own considerations and make sure that you are being clear about whether you're doing values or, or finance. Sounds easy. Right. Uh, on, on to that, be continued. On that, that's absolutely. That. See you all next year. On that note, I just want to say a huge thank you to our three panellists for talking us through that very complex issue and, and we'll hand back over to our MC. Thank you. Thank you.